some who lived to tell the tale of their battle with a tiger were faced with a grisly task, recovering the remains of other Allied Sherman crew. Wally Tarrant remembers. The biggest part was down in Lisieres, where we lost four tanks in one street. I saw I'd come down because I knew them all, you know, and we went into the tank to try and see if we could find anybody we knew, and that was terrible, you know. Mm. You found a pair of shoes, and is that track pin wash, I thought. I said, he had big yeah. feet, I thought, that must be him, you know. Yeah. And then the driver I knew, and I thought, that's the driver. He says, yeah, but we got to be sure of it, find his tag, you know. Mm. And a lot of them were just called missing. A German Tiger taking a direct hit from a Sherman round produced very different results. For German crews, the Tiger's thick armor made it a safe place to be. When you were hit, let's say, by a Sherman, you thought uh, there was a lightning in your tank for a few seconds, except that sometimes I was thrown back a little bit. But afterwards, uh, it was as if nothing had happened. So not only did the German Tiger surpass the Allied Sherman in terms of firepower, its armor appeared to be resistant to anything the Allies could fire at it. But in time, all that would change. Now again, it's true, the 75mm gun was not particularly effective against the frontal armor of a Tiger. Uh, what's interesting is by 1944, mid-1944, the Germans though were all already acknowledging that the Tiger was no longer immune to all the different weapons that were available to the Allies. And that's uh, made pretty obvious by the fact that Tiger I production had ended by that point, or was ending and being replaced by the Tiger II, um, which was, had substantially heavier armor. Um, incidentally, it's, it, the U.S. Army uh, throughout the ETO have far more encounters with Tiger IIs than they do Tiger Ones. The Tiger Ones, after the Normandy campaign, become uh, more and more rare because they're not being produced anymore, um, and you know Tiger Twos are coming into service. So, and, and even uh, according to the Buckley book, the German higher ups were issuing uh, warnings to Tiger crews by this point in the war that you know you can't just sort of do whatever you want and expect to be completely immune from enemy fire the way sort of you've been able to do in 19 you know sort of 43. Uh, when the Tiger really was immune to, to most of the weapon systems it was facing. By 44, the, the battlefields, th there's more weapons out there that can, that can hurt it. Um, was it a well-armored vehicle by the standards of 1944? Absolutely. Um, although it's funny, if you look at it, f was it well-armored compared to other vehicles of its weight class or even vehicles that were lighter? And not particularly. For a 56-ton tank, um, you know, particularly because the armor is vertically placed, um, it's sort of a large boxy design. It's it, it it's an early design that was already being surpassed uh, by other designs coming into service by that part of the war um, in terms of uh, sort of efficiency of, of armor versus the weight uh, uh, provided. In the weeks after the D-Day landings. Allied Sherman tanks had been decimated by the devastating firepower of the German Tiger tank force. Stories of Shermans penetrating the Tiger's thick armor with their tiny 75mm guns were few and far between. That was until a British innovation changed the Sherman into a tank that could challenge the Tiger head on, the Firefly. The Firefly was a uh, last-minute, desperate attempt to put a really decent gun into the Sherman tank. And the British had available the 17-pounder, which was more or less equivalent to the Tiger's 88mm. Uh, they tried to put it into the Sherman, found it wouldn't fit. And in the end, ingeniously, they got it fitted into the turret by doing a 90 degrees twist and they were able to insert it into the rather smaller turret of the Sherman. This is the Sherman as it was originally developed with a 75mm gun. This is the Sherman Firefly with a 17-pounder anti-tank gun. The pea shooter, 
the tank killer. That ought to give them something to think about. But it was too little, too late. The Allied Sherman Firefly, even with its superior artillery, was never produced in mass quantities, primarily because the Americans were reluctant to fit a foreign gun on their tanks. Rounds one and two, firepower and armor, belong to the German Tiger tank. Will the Sherman turn the tables when it comes to mobility? Okay, so there's some things that we need to address in that one. Number one, the f idea that the Firefly wasn't ever built in large numbers. Uh, the British converted enough to have uh, one Firefly for every troop uh, of Sherman tanks. So out of every four British Sherman tanks, one is a Firefly. That was sort of how they organized it. Um, so the U.S. really didn't have anything to do with it. The Firefly is not a U.S. gun. The U.S. never produced it. The U.S. did not adopt it. The U.S. tested it. Um, and they uh, thought it was a pretty good gun, but we were developing our 76mm gun. And we were developing a whole new turret. Uh, which was, you know, the, sort of the, T, the T-23 turret that would end up going on the Sherman, the 76mm gun Shermans. Uh, so the Firefly uh, was not something that the, the U.S. looked at and thought was appropriate for U.S. forces. It didn't meet our standards, particularly on crew ergonomics. Um, when you shove that huge 17-pounder in a Sherman turret, the 75mm gun sh turret, you've, you do create some um, uh, less-than-ideal crew ergonomic issues. We'll just put it that way. So uh, it, it wasn't that the U.S. didn't recognize the need for a better gun than the 75. We were developing it. It was a 76. Unfortunately, the 76 was not in service uh, with U.S. forces when they went into Normandy. It doesn't really come into service until about the time of Operation Cobra, which is just a little while after uh, Goodwood, actually. So in, in that initial period, uh, right after D-Day, the, the Firefly is the most powerfully armed Sherman tank in terms of hole punching ability. Um, but you sort of also lose a bunch of things with the Firefly as well. You lose the bow machine gun, you lose the effective high explosive round of the 75 millimeter gun. Um, so there's trade-offs. Um, but the idea that the, Brit the United States didn't want the Firefly or the, 70, or the 17 pounder because it wasn't made here that's another one of those things that's just not true. Um, the U.S. did adopt foreign design weapon systems when they were recognized to fit U.S. requirements. So, for example, the 57mm anti-tank gun. It's the British six-pounder. We had no problem adopting that. Look at most of the anti-aircraft guns we had, the 20 and 40 millimeters, you know, those Arlequins and Bofors. Those are not U.S. designs, and we made thousands and thousands of those because um, they fit the requirement the U.S. Army had. The 17-pounder didn't fit our requirement, at least not uh, as it went into the, the, the Sherman and the Firefly conversion. At almost twice the weight of the Allied Sherman, the German Tiger could only reach a top speed of 23 miles per hour. The Sherman was much faster and could go places where the larger Tiger would simply get stuck. Shermans are very mobile. They were a reasonably fast tank. I've actually been in the Sherman getting up to about 30 miles an hour, which is quite a hairy experience. In the Sherman, you could go along any normal metalled road, cross country. The Tigers were much, much slower but also, of course, their weight told against them. At 56 tonnes, it's fine going along nice, flat, dry ground. Once you start getting into mud, they're going to sink. Once you start going over small bridges, the bridges are going to crumble. The Sherman was perhaps much better, much faster. Our maneuverability was uh, really inadequate. Now. And the engine was, uh, was too slow. And it wasn't just on the move that the Allied Sherman was faster than the German Tiger. Its turret could turn more rapidly, an advantage that could mean the difference between life and death. If you compare it with the Sherman, I would say the Sherman is, was much better. It took us three to five minutes turning the turret round by hand, and perhaps uh, two minutes or one minute and a half by engine. So although inferior in terms of firepower and armor, the Allied Sherman was vastly superior to the German Tiger when it came to mobility. Not only did the Sherman win this round, 
It also had something else, something colossal on its side. The full weight of the American automobile industry. And this car held the key to the eventual dominance of the Sherman over the German Tiger on the battlefield. Here in the Detroit tank arsenal, we forged the armaments of victory. Back in the U.S., everyone was working together to help the Allied war effort in Europe. Not only were the public playing their part, but in this golden age of cooperation, the big three car manufacturers, General Motors, Chrysler, and Ford, joined forces to take control of Sherman tank production. As a result, new Shermans rolled off the assembly lines using components taken directly from the automobile industry. For example, this Ford Pilot's V8 engine was also fitted to some Sherman tanks. This flexibility in construction, simple design, and massive manufacturing backup meant that in Normandy, destroyed Allied Shermans could be replaced in 36 hours. Okay, this section on mobility is weird. Uh, first off, comparing the, the Sherman and the Tiger, the, the, the Tiger actually had pretty good tactical mobility for a 56-ton vehicle. Uh, the tracks are quite wide. Its ground pressure is actually um, uh, not bad at all compared to the Sherman. In fact, the Sherman is usually what you read more about having issues with, with mud unless it was fitted with, with track extenders um, or until much later in the war when they come out with the HVSS suspension and the wider track. So um, I, I'm not sure that you can claim that the Sherman was better in mud. You know, that said, it's it's always hard to make gross generalizations. Now, the weight of the Tiger certainly did affect it when it came to bridges, because some bridges wouldn't be able to uh, hold that kind of weight. Um, the bigger issue with mobility for the Tiger is sort of strategic and operational mobility. Um, it cannot drive long distances on its own to get to the battlefield um, without suffering um, a high chance of mechanical breakdown. It's also at 56 tons and a very difficult vehicle to recover when it is broken down. The Germans just don't have the recovery via vehicles to handle um, their own heavy tanks. So the real advantage that Sherman has is sort of that operational and strategic mobility. I'm not sure that on the immediate tactical level, um, and in fact, you know, the, the transmission on the Tiger is much more sophisticated. It can it can can pivot steer, neutral steer, whatever you want to call it. The Sherman cannot. Um, so, I think we want to be careful when we talk about the Sherman being more more mobile. Um, you know, it depends on, on, on what you mean by that word, whether we're talking about, um, uh, like I said, tactical versus operational, strategic level. Yes, the Sherman tank's faster, in particular on pavement. That's where that sort of more narrow track with rubber pads comes in handy. Um, uh, but but for for the, for the weight of the Tiger, it's it's actually a surprisingly mobile vehicle um, for the standards of that day. Uh, the part about U.S. industry is, as they described, it's pretty weird. Um, yes, the big three played a huge role in tank production. Chrysler ran the, the tank uh, arsenal in 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 in, in Warren outside of Detroit, which produced. Uh, <laughs> a staggering amount of, of tanks. But it wasn't just the big three. Um, uh, there were other companies, um, particularly some of the locomotive uh, makers as well, that contributed significant numbers to, to tank production. The, the thing that about the Ford Pilot car engine, I, I don't even know where that came from. The, the Ford engine that went into a Sherman was the GAA. It's a 500 horsepower engine. It was derived from an aircraft engine. It's... It's massive. It's a massive tank engine to 400 or 500 horsepower. It's not going to a car. The pilot was a post-war British car. Uh, I, I don't even... I, maybe they're confusing it with the Chrysler engine that was used in the multibank is the only thing I can think of, but boy, they screwed that up. I don't even know where they were going with that. So, okay. When I was knocked out, I went straight back. They gave me a Sherman straight away, get back up. Our tank was an older one than the one we'd lost. And uh, it had been uh, belonged to a squadron leader, a major, who'd had his head blown off in there. And they cleaned it all up and disinfected it, and that was pretty good. And uh, they put us in that, and off we went. The Germans didn't have that kind of industrial backing. In fact, it could be argued that one of Hitler's greatest mistakes 
was to have commissioned such an enormous and complicated machine like the Tiger, when much simpler tanks could have been built in greater numbers. For every one Tiger coming off the production line, the Germans could have afforded to build three of their smaller but lethal Panzer Mark IVs. They lost the plot of it. And this is the problem with all of their industry. They were still producing grandiose products right up to 1945, when they should have just concentrated on some of their proven successes and just concentrate on getting those out as quickly as possible. The German Tiger was a complex, over-engineered machine, which shared few common parts with any other German tank. It took a long time to make, was less reliable, and had sparse ground assistance when it needed repair. In the field of combat, a minor fault could disable the Tiger. And unlike the Allied Sherman, a dead Tiger could not be replaced easily. We had lots of uh, engine trouble. In my Le Corps, after 100 yards, it was already broken down. So we had to wait for people to get it running again, who never came, by the way. You know? The war ended before they actually arrived. Now a reconstruction of a typical tank battle will demonstrate how the Allied military strategists used the Sherman's superior numbers to overrun the defending German Tigers and to beat a path through Europe and eventually to victory over the Nazis. Imagine a little scenario in Normandy. We have a Tiger tank here sitting up in a hedgerow hidden from the Allies. We have a troop of four Shermans crossing a field. The first one, his towers will be turning, they'll be on the lookout for anything suspicious. The Tiger would take him out straight away with one shot. The second Sherman, he'll realize there's an enemy gun or something in the hedgerow. He will probably try and aim a shot towards the hedgerow, roughly where he thinks whatever it is might be. But by then, the Tiger has reloaded and has taken this one out. The third tank, he will have seen the Tiger by now. He will try and use his other tanks as shield. He will come round. He might be able to get a shot off. And he will make a beeline for a sunken ravine over on the other side. But by then, the Tiger will have reloaded. He will have gone. In the meantime, the fourth member of the troop, seeing what's happening, he will know the only vulnerable spot on the Tiger is the rear. He will try and go round to the rear of the tank and he will try and take out the Tiger from the rear. and we have one Sherman out of four surviving. So the typical tank encounter that's displayed on the hood of the Jeep with the little Airfix models or whatever he's got going on there, uh, I take that with a real big grain of salt. And the reason is that um, I don't think it was doctrine for German tanks, particularly heavy tanks, to operate individually, just sort of solo out there waiting to ambush the, uh, the Sherman tank coming by. Uh, doctrine in armies is that, you know, Tanks operate in units, platoons or troops or whatever, so, you know, this idea that, you know, it takes five Sherman tanks to, to kill a Tiger, it's, the reason you would send five Shermans to confront anything is because, in the U.S. Army at least, five Sherman tanks is a platoon, you're not going to issue anything smaller than a platoon, like, to go out and fulfill a mission. Um, that's just not the way, way things operated. So, I'm really skeptical about that whole sort of you know, a single Tiger and five Shermans and or four or whatever he had there. It was, it was very reminiscent of sort of that scene in the film Fury, which, uh, you know, it's a sort of the stereotype. But um, 
what's interesting is if you actually look at the reports the U.S. Army did after the war um, on tank-on-tank -tank combat in the, the ETO, what they found was the most critical factor in any particular engagement in terms of what, uh, what guaranteed success had less to do with the technical characteristics or advantages or disadvantages of any um, vehicle in the encounter. The advantage usually went to um, whoever was in the better tactical situation, and that meant whoever saw the enemy first. Because if you see the enemy first, you shoot first, you fire first, you probably hit them first. Um, and that, more than anything else, was what determined uh, success or failure in any, any particular instance. And since the Germans are primarily are on the defense, they probably have a better chance of seeing uh, their opponent first. So that's the big advantage they have in, in this point. So it's less to do with um, sort of the technical differences in the vehicles and more to do with some of these tactical issues that determine success in any particular encounter. Um, at least that's what the post-war studies showed. You know, and as far as uh, when German tank units did take uh, offensive actions uh, in various instances in that campaign, it didn't always turn out very well. So um, if you read uh, Zologos Patton versus the Panzers, uh, which is the Battle of our court in uh, September of 44, a bunch of supposedly superior German Panthers really got their asses handed to them by a bunch of Shermans and M18 tank destroyers. Um, again, not going to go into details, you can read the book, but um, it, training tactics, there's so many other factors that go into success, uh, go into whether or not any particular armored encounter um, is successful or not, that has to, you know, other than just technical characteristics of the vehicles. And just as the Shermans were sacrificed for the Allied war effort, so too were their crews. I felt very expendable, especially when we landed in Normandy. And when you see so many casualties in Normandy, and every day we were having casualties, you did feel, is my number next, you know. In the end, the Allies won the ground war by their sheer numbers. The Sherman was produced in massive quantities, almost 50,000 of them. But only about 1,300 German Tigers were ever built. In order to advance through Europe and onto Berlin as swiftly as possible, Allied generals realized that even if they had to sacrifice three or four Shermans and their crews to destroy one Tiger, they would still have plenty to replace their losses, whereas the Nazis would not. Based purely on numbers, the Sherman was the superior weapon. But given a choice between the tanks, the crews on both sides had a different view. But I think I'd better say the tiger. I'd rather be in a tiger myself. I'd have to say it'd be the tiger. I think I'd go for the tiger. There's no question about it. I would always choose the tiger. This contest wasn't about quality. It was about quantity. Although the Allied Sherman was inferior to the German tiger, both defensively and offensively, the Sherman's superiority in numbers overran and eventually defeated all the tiger tanks. In 1945, the Sherman led the Allied forces onto Berlin and to victory. And that's why the Sherman tank wins this great military clash. So that's the end of the documentary, and I'll just point out their statement about Sherman's leading the Allies to Berlin is a little weird since the Western Allies didn't actually get to Berlin, that was the Soviets, who did of course have some Sherman tanks, but mostly had their own T-34s and, and JS-2s and whatnot. Um, and, you know, the whole sort of quantity versus quality arguments is to really overly simplistic. Um, and again, the, it's, it's massively exaggerated because they're comparing the Tiger, which was a very specialized, low-production vehicle, to the Sherman, which was the mass-produced medium tank. The, yes, the Germans were outnumbered in terms of AFV production, but comparing the Tiger to the Sherman creates, for the viewer, somebody who might not be very well informed on this topic, it, it makes that disparity seem much bigger than it actually is, because you got 50,000 versus 1,300. You know, that's that's not, not it wasn't that bad for, for, for the Germans in terms of the numbers. The numbers weren't good by any stretch, but they weren't produced by a factor of, you know, what is that, like 40? Um, 
So um, it's it's just an extremely flawed documentary. Obviously, it's produced to uh, keep people watching, not to inform them um, or educate. And it's just a waste of resources because obviously they had a budget. They had access to these veterans. They had access to these vehicles and the, and, 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 and the recreation parts. Um, and it's just used to produce junk. It's, it's, just, it's just bad. So um, hopefully people enjoy this. If, if so, I'll do another one because, again, there's one for um, uh, the uh, Engineering Disasters, I think was the series. And that one stars Belton Cooper, um, author of Death Traps, a book that's always a fun source of controversy. So if you like it, uh, well, i got to do my typical thing. Subscribe. Give to the Patreon, or just comment and say, "Hey, do 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 more of these. It's fun to take apart these documentaries, um, if they can be called that, if they even deserve that title." All right. Well, thank you, and we will catch you on the next one.